Yeah. Okay, so we have our next speaker who's going to come up here and talk in just a second. And I appreciate yeah, you guys paying attention um, and joining us again tonight. But we have Veronica Demchuk, who's one of our urogynecologists who practices with UF Health Women's Center. And so I'm going to go turn over to you now. Thank you. All right. All right. We're on. Hi, I'm Veronica Demchuk. I'm one of the female colic medicine and reconstructive surgeons at UF. That's a mouthful, otherwise known as the urogynecologist. I've been here for a year now. I'm really excited for this event. I have to say I'm learning a lot actually from my colleagues. So this is very beneficial for myself as well. So the two most common conditions that I treat in my practice is prolapse and urinary incontinence. So that will be the focus of my talk today, but I will touch base on some kind of basics of pelvic health and pelvic anatomy, just to familiarize everyone with it. So we have a wonderful team of urogynecologists at UF. Um, Dr. Emily Weber-Lebron is the chief of the division. She has been here the longest. We also have Dr. Jessica Heft, myself, Dr. Louis Moy, and then our physician assistant, Emma Kissel. So how does one actually become a female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgeon? So there are a couple of different paths that we can take. Doctors Weber, Heft, and myself, after college and medical school, did four years of OBGYN residency and then three-year fellowship in reconstructive surgery, whereas Dr. Lewis Moore actually first did five years of urology residency followed by two years of pelvic surgery fellowship. So different paths that lead us, led us to this point. So as I mentioned, our specialty is also known as urogynecology, and as the name suggests, it's a combination of urology, meaning that we treat certain conditions of the lower urinary tract, and that consists of the bladder and the urethra. It also, uh, our specialty also comprises of gynecology, of course, meaning that we also deal with conditions of the female genital tract, and that consists of the uterus, cervix, vagina, and the external female genitalia. So the conditions that we treat can be congenital, meaning that a woman may be born with an abnormality of her urogenital tract, or a condition can be acquired, meaning that a woman develops certain condition or disorder during her lifetime. This is uh, a schematic kind of of the side view of female's body. Um, and I wanted to point out the relevant pelvic organs. So in the front, we have the bladder and the urethra, the uterus and vagina, and then the rectum. And you can see that they're in close proximity to one another. And they also share one thing in common, that, that they rely on the pelvic floor muscles for support. And so these pelvic floor muscles are a huge part of our practice to stay continent of urine and stool and to have appropriate support of the pelvic organs. Those muscles have to have good tone and strength. At the same time, those muscles need to function properly and know when to relax in order for you to avoid and empty your bladder comfortably or to move your bowels appropriately and also to have um, to not have discomfort with sex. So the conditions that we treat oftentimes fall into this category of pelvic floor disorders. This includes pelvic organ prolapse, voiding the dysfunction or abnormal bladder function, such as overactive bladder and urinary incontinence abnormal bowel function or defecatory dysfunction, such as fecal incontinence or accidental uh, loss of bowel control, certain types of constipation. And then lastly, different types of pelvic pain conditions, such as interstitial cystitis or bladder pain syndrome and dyspareunia, which is pain with sex. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be focusing mostly on pelvic organ prolapse and urinary incontinence. So pelvic floor disorders are extremely common. One third of women at least have at least one or more pelvic floor disorder. And these disorders tremendously affect your quality of life. They may limit your desire to socialize, to see a family and friends. They may limit your desire to be intimate with your partner. They may affect your ability to um, maintain appropriate hygiene and they can imp impact your mental health. They can cause anxiety and depression. So a lot of women, unfortunately, suffer silently with pelvic floor disorders. And that is why it's so important to educate you about them and our ability to help you. So let's focus first on pelvic organ prolapse. So the definition is that it's herniation of pelvic organs into the vagina. It is caused by weakened pelvic muscles that I uh, pointed out earlier and weakened connective tissue in the pelvis. The interesting fact about that I find interesting about prolapse is that at least 50% of women have some degree of prolapse. The majority of them are not symptomatic and only 3% actually seek any treatment for that, meaning that most of prolapse is asymptomatic. You live and die with it without ever needing to have it evaluated or treated. There are about 30,000 prolapse surgeries performed every year in the United States. So pretty common um, uh, surgery. 
So again, let's look at some anatomy. So this is again, that side view of the female pelvis. In the front, we have the bladder, the uterus, and then the rectum. So if you have a weakened support of the anterior wall of the vagina highlighted here in blue, you notice how that sits under the bladder. So that weakened wall, those weakened muscles will result in the bladder dropping down. So oftentimes that's called a dropped bladder or cystocele or anterior wall prolapse. On exam, it may look like just an internal bulge, slight kind of laxity under the bladder, or you may have a large protrusion from the vagina. Similarly, you can have weakened posterior vaginal wall, again, highlighted in blue, and that would allow for the herniation of the rectum into the vagina. We call it rectocele or posterior wall prolapse. And again, on pelvic exam, we may see just a slight laxity of the posterior vaginal wall, which is internal, or you may have, again, a large bulge protruding from the vagina. And lastly, you can have uh, weakened support at the top of the vagina where the uterus sits, or if you had a hysterectomy, just kind of the blind end of the vagina, which we call the apex. So that would result in uterine prolapse or just vaginal vault prolapse. And again, you, on exam, you may see just the cervix sitting just close to the vaginal opening, or you can have much more pronounced uterine prolapse. This is called uterine procedenture. This is as bad as it gets. That's the worst kind of you know, complete prolapse. So common symptoms of prolapse, as I alluded to, vaginal bulge is the most common presentation. You may also report a sense of pelvic pressure. You may have some associated back pain, or you may report um, difficulty urinating or emptying your bowels. Indications for treatment is really based on your prolapse. As I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of women have prolapse but are not bothered by it. So I have a lot of consultations where women come because they're told they have prolapse, but they otherwise would never know about it. And so if you don't have bothersome symptoms, I would not recommend any treatment because I cannot make an asymptomatic person any better, right? Um, and of course, though, if you have associated urinary symptoms such as obstructed urination or obstruct, obstructed defecation, those would definitely be indications for treatment. Treatment options um, vary from conservatives, such as pelvic floor physical therapy, again, targeting those pelvic floor muscles to give you better support for your pelvic organs. Now, pelvic exercises will not undo the prolapse that you already have, but they will make you feel overall more supported and can slow down the progression of pro prolapse that you already have and hopefully avoid indication for any further treatment. We also offer vaginal pessaries, which are vaginal inserts. As shown here, they come in many different shapes and sizes. They can look a little bit intimidating for some people. Um, but the goal of the pessary, of this vaginal insert, is to keep the prolapse internal. And the pessary fitting appointment is really a little bit of a guessing game, quite honestly. We call them guesseries for that reason, because we're trying to figure out the right fit for you, the right shape and size. And once we do, then you would be comfortable with it being inserted in the vagina. You would, know not, would not know that it's there at all. So it's supposed to be a comfortable intervention. And then lastly, of course, we are reconstructive surgeons. So of course, offer research, we offer surgeries for prolapse. And our scope of surgeries is really broad. And among the four providers at UF, we really do provide kind of the full breadth and depth of pelvic reconstructive surgery. The point of reconstructive surgery is to correct the prolapsed vagina and to restore the normal anatomy. And we can do that through vaginal approaches or through abdominal approaches, such as laparoscopy or robotic surgery. There's also a category of surgery called obliterative surgery, um, in which we actually close off the vaginal canal, which can sound a little bit barbaric, but if you think for, uh, for a woman who does not have a partner, is not looking for a partner, never intends to have vaginal intercourse, this is actually the perfect surgery that is fast to do, it usually takes about an hour, hour and a half, um, and it's essentially 100% effective because if the vaginal canal is mostly closed off, no prolapse can come back through it. So it's all a, it's a matter of finding the right candidate for the right surgery. And every surgery we perform is individualized to your anatomy. And now we'll shift gears and talk about urinary incontinence. So urinary incontinence is an ability to control the flow of urine. And it falls in two main categories. One is stress urinary incontinence, so leakage of urine during any kind of activity or exertion, anything that puts a lot of force in the pelvis coughing, sneezing, lifting, bending, squatting, things like that. 
Another type of incontinence is urge incontinence. So leakage of urine when you have a strong urge to urinate. You get that sudden warning, you gotta go and you can't reach the toilet and you lose control of your bladder. And you may be lucky enough to have a combination of both. And then that's called mixed urinary incontinence and the treatment would be a combination of for both conditions. So for stress urinary incontinence, as I mentioned, you're leaking urine with anything that puts, puts uh, pressure on the pelvis. And the etiology, the, the cause of stress incontinence is a weakened pelvic support under the urethra, which is the opening through which you urinate, and the bladder. So treatment options with stress urinary incontinence are targeting that support under the urethra. That again can be done with pelvic floor physical therapy, strengthening the surrounding muscles can be highly effective, especially for minor uh, versions of stress incontinence. There are actually vaginal pessaries that are designed specifically for stress urinary incontinence as well. And actually on the same note, there is um, an over-the-counter device called Impressa found in most pharmacies. It looks kind of like a tampon device actually, but it's shaped differently in a way to give support to the urethra. So it's something you could try before even seeing one of us for evaluation. And then lastly, we offer surgeries for stress incontinence to again, create support for that urethra. The most common surgery, the gold standard for stress incontinence is the sling procedure, um, where we implant a permanent material, a mesh material under the urethra to give it support. It is highly effective, 85 to 95% effective at it, treating, improving or curing stress urinary incontinence. It's a 30 minute procedure and you go home the same day. So it's minimally invasive, but pretty fast recovery. For urge urinary incontinence, um, it falls into the spectrum of a condition called overactive bladder. So you, your bladder is literally overactive. You, ha you have a sense of more frequency to urinate with more urgency. And as a result, with that urgency, you may leak urine and have urge urinary incontinence. I describe overactive bladder to patients as a miscommunication between your bladder and your brain. A normal bladder is a large stretchy muscle that should stay relaxed and fill comfortably to capacity, at which point it's telling your brain, I'm full, I have to go. But an overactive bladder is not yet full, but it's already sending those uh, false signals saying, I'm full, I gotta go. So then the brain says, okay, go ahead. So you're going every 30 minutes, every hour, every two hours. Patients with overactive bladder know where every single restroom is in the town, right? They kind of, they outline their day knowing where every restroom is. It's a common thing that my patients tell me. So treatment for overactive bladder is to get it to calm down, to relieve that urgency, the bladder spasms. So again, um, for over, sorry, sorry, that's a typo. For urge urinary incontinence, behavioral changes actually can play a huge role. I take a lot of time to figure out exactly what your habits are as far as how often you're going, how often you're leaking, what you're putting in fluid-wise and food-wise. Um, and sometimes actually I will have patients complete a bladder diary where they record every time they're urinating how much, every time they're putting in a fluid, what kind and how much. I wanna know exactly what goes in and what goes out. In our society, I find that there's this excessive push to drink more water. Like water is the cure for weight loss, for glowing skin, for everything. But excessive fluid intake will result, result in excessive you're an output, right? So I wanna gauge if we can modify something like that. Pelvic PT can also help. Um, oral medications focus on relaxing that bladder. Um, and then we provide um, a couple of procedures on the bladder as well. So bladder Botox, um, just like Botox being injected into the muscles of your face to relax your face and not have wrinkles, bladder is a muscle. So we inject it into the muscle so it can stay more relaxed. And that therapy lasts on average four to six months. So it can give you nice long-term benefits before needing repeat injections. And the other therapy we provide is called sacral neuromodulation, where we implant essentially a pacemaker for the bladder um, that sends signals to the nerve that controls the bladder and helps it to function more normally. That therapy, the battery life is 10 to 15 years. So it's a really nice long-term therapy for over overactive bladder as well. Um, and I think that's it for me, actually. So among the four of us, we can be found at any three of these clinics. We're happy to see you and help you have a better quality of life. Um, I'm happy to have any questions this time. All right, do we have any questions out there? A couple coming in from the back. Someone asked the question, um, how can I schedule physical therapy for incontinence? Do I need to see you first? 
Um, you, you don't actually have to see me first. Um, uh, your primary care provider can put a referral for physical therapy. Um, through UF, we have uh, rehab at Med Plaza and in Magnolia Park. It is usually a one to two month uh, wait list. So if you're leaning towards it, you know, get the referral and get it scheduled. Okay, someone asked a question. Does having a C-section delivery decrease the chance of organ prolapse? Yes and no. So parity, meaning pregnancy in general, is a risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse simply because an enlarging uterus growing a baby is a lot of weight to carry on your pelvis. The only thing that a C-section is protective for is um, avoiding injury to your rect, um, anal sphincter. So it reduces the risk of fecal incontinence or accidental bowel leakage, but not urinary incontinence or prolapse. Okay. Uh, someone asked a question. I'm having no issues that I know of, but sometimes when urinating, uh, it flows fast. Other times it, it flows slower. Is this normal? And why is that so? Most likely normal. Sorry. Um, it could be a matter of positional change. You may have a very small degree of prolapse and sometimes leaning forward, leaning back can alter the urine stream. Um, but I would say that's normal as long as you feel that you're emptying correct, uh, fully. So another question, um, I will sit at my desk and not have to urinate, but once I do, I can't stop. Is that indicative of a problem or? So what was the first part? So I will sit at my desk yep. for a long period of time and not have to urinate. Okay. Once I do urinate, I can't stop. Is that indicative of a um, I hope I understand it correctly. Um, what a lot of women will describe is they're busy doing something while sitting, they're watching TV for extended period of time, they're at a computer on Zoom for hours, and then it's been a while, they stand up and all of a sudden there's that urge to urinate. That's a very, com I don't know if that's what you're asking, but that's a very common complaint. And that's usually because when we're in the seated position, um, the bladder isn't really signaling the brain so much that it has to go, but the moment you stand up, all that urine with gravity pulls at the bottom of the bladder and that's where the bladder is most sensitive. And all of a sudden, and there's the realization the bladder is full and you gotta go. I, I'm sorry if I didn't answer your question exactly. Hi, um, my name's Yvette. I'm one of the pelvic floor physical therapists. And I just wanted to, to mention we're booked out pretty far. So actually, oh, more than it's, like, months? it's three months oh my gosh. to get in right I'm now. I'm sending you all that business. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And we have one of our therapists is on maternity leave. So, but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's well worth the wait, but I just wanted to mention that you want to kind of take that into account when you're thinking about scheduling. So I have to say there's just not enough emphasis on the benefits of pelvic PT in women. It should be really standard of care to educate us on how to do Kegels properly and all of that kind of lags here. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, how long does the bladder mesh or bladder sling, how long does that last? So I don't have an answer for that. The, the first sling came out, I think, in 1998. That sling is not on the market anymore. So the longest published data, I believe, is five to 10 years. Um, but we don't have data longer than that. And, and its efficacy does decline with time. I believe by 10 years, it's about 65% effective, I want to say. Um, and, and that's kind of it's an objective data. Subjectively, a woman will report continued benefit from it. Okay. How effective is Detrol for incontinence? I've had a sling and Botox and I'm experiencing symptoms again. So Detrol is one of the oral medications that helps overactive bladder. It can be effective for some women. Um, it really varies. If you um, have Botox and Detrol on top of it, it's kind of a combined therapy. I would want to do more work up truthfully to know if that's the right therapy for that patient. Okay, a couple more quick questions. Do uh, Using a menstrual cup, does that increase your chance of prolapse? It should not, no. And then could you just kind of talk about some of the treatment uh, or clarify a little bit more about mixed incontinence? what mixed urinary incontinence is. So mixed urinary incontinence is the combination of both conditions, the stress incontinence, the leakage of coughing, laughing, sneezing, exertion, and also the overactive bladder and urge incontinence. So when you have a mixed picture, I always ask, which one is the worst? Which one is more bothersome? Of course, both are annoying and affect your quality.